6 a.m., an altar boy is preparing the vessels for the sacraments. It's time to make the coffee. Hello to all, and welcome to the Earwicker Podcast. Follow along with our host, Vince Corkery, as he discusses a broad range of musical topics with interviews of top players, club owners, producers, and engineers that make it all happen. Your virtual backstage pass. Remember to like and subscribe to this podcast. And of course, it's free. Hello to all, and welcome to the Earwicker Podcast. And today we have a really special guest, musician, mu- musical archivist, uh, actually well known through the musical community. It's John Ellis. Thanks for coming, John. All right. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. I'm glad you're here and wasting a little time with us. So here at Earwicker, um, I'm going to uh, ask you, I, uh, you are from St. Louis. Did you grow up here? And, and um, Moved to De Pere in 1958 from Chicago. Oh. oh. So I lived in uh, De Pere from 58 to 64 and then moved to Warson Woods. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. And uh, what what uh, do you think uh, attracted you to music or the guitar? I know we we know you play guitar, so. Yeah. Um I think um, probably my mom and I used to watch a lot of uh, variety TV shows mm-hmm. when when that was a big thing. You know, not just Ed Sullivan, yeah. but that style of thing. So you get to see a lot of, you know, magicians uh-huh. and musicians and dancers. And, uh-huh. and so that, that kind of started me, I think, being interested in music. My mom always had the radio on, and her favorite station was KSD, which they played some pop music. Mm-hmm. They didn't play, like, Beatles or anything like that, or, but they, you know they they played popular hits, oh, okay. um, along with you know just the the fun radio stuff, and uh, so I guess really what got me into music was KXOK. Oh wow! And I probably started listening in maybe around 1960. Wow! Okay. Right when you know the everyone was getting their little transistor radios. Uh, so what what how did the guitar uh, end up in your you know? Okay, so my lapse? I think. The there was the folk boom or the folk scare that came, that came around in the <laughs> yeah. in the mid to late fifties, and I <clears throat> figured out that there was a guitar in the basement of our house that I guess my mom had taken an interest in for mm. who knows how long. I, I don't even re- ever remember her playing it, but I remember it being downstairs, mm. and so uh, there was a chord book there, and and so you know I taught myself a handful of things, and uh, this was probably in 62 or 63. Oh, okay. But I wasn't really playing. I was just kind of, you know, just had it as Mm. a a thing, Uh you know. So how did did you get there to some of your first bands? Um, Well, when when the Beatles came out in January of 64, then, you know, the the neighborhood kids, we would have uh, bands, but... Mm. You know, they would mainly be tennis racket bands where we would play the records <laughs> uh, and yeah. then stand up uh, and sing. Right. And, of course, since I was John, I got to be John. And, <laughs> and I made sure my little brothers were, you know, in the background. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. But, yeah, that was a tennis racket band. Oh, okay. Well, um, so uh, so you started playing guitar at a uh, pretty early age? or? Yeah, I, I was playing uh, certainly by... You know the time the Beatles came around, and then I was able to start picking up the, ah. the simple uh, chord structures of their songs. Okay, um, and I'd go to uh, Mel Bay Music every Saturday oh. and hang out. And uh, was that in Kirkwood? That was in Kirkwood on on Jefferson there. Mm. And uh, Mel was always in the store. And when <laughs> the young kids came in, and you know we'd go over to the uh, 
you know, where they'd have the sheet music. And, and that was back in the day when the chords were completely wrong mm. in the sheet music. Mm. You know, like there'd mm. be a, uh, a Rolling Stones song that was obviously in the key of E, like Satisfaction. Mm. At the same time, the, you know, the sheet music would be an A flat or E flat. <laughs> you know, it's, for a horn player, maybe. For a horn player, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Mel would always come by. You know, we'd be in there trying to memorize the lyrics because, you know, Mm. We didn't have the money right. to, to pay for it. He'd, he'd always come over and, you guys going to buy anything today? <laughs> All right. When when did you start going to, like, live shows in St. Louis area? Or, and where could you go to for that? Okay, so most of the music I saw in late grade school, certainly by uh, sixth grade, was going to CYC shows. And... and uh, so I was raised. What were those? When we... uh, CYC stands for Catholic Youth Council. Excellent. And uh, there was a newspaper uh, in town. I, I guess there still is called the St. Louis Review. Mm. And the, <clears throat> the entertainment section of the St. Louis Review, they listed all the movies, and they would give you know short reviews and advise Catholics which which <laughs> movies were objectionable. Of course, then we'd get. <laughs> out our magic marker and, and circle uh, all the ones all the that, that it was, oops, they said, i got to see this. And, uh, <laughs> but then they, uh, in the entertainment section also, they listed Friday, Saturday, and Sunday all the parishes that were having live music. And, and that means every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, literally dozens of churches all across uh, St. Louis were having uh, uh, live bands. Wow. And all the live bands at the time were, uh, let's say, soul bands. And, and they were all, uh, almost all of them were integrated. Mm. Some of them were all black, like uh, Oliver Sane mm. was all black. And yeah. then some of them were all white. But, but the basic model for all the soul bands that I saw in 67 and 60, mm. 66 and 67 and 68 mm. was that a lot of the players were white. Almost all the singers were black. Wow! And uh, they do you, were. Do you remember some of the names of the bands? Oh, there, well, there's Cecil Davis, and there was the Soul Town Review, and the Impacts, and cool. and oh, uh, wow. they're they're all listed on that Metro St. Louis uh, historical site or music uh, site. Oh, okay. Uh, which we should link because it's yeah, it's got a lot of good information about the bands back oh, then. Okay. A lot of really good pictures too. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Wow, well, that's good to know. Um, but th this was back in a, in the day when, um, uh, you know, it was it was a soul band in the sense they would have a full horn section, and they would usually have at least one or two male singers and at least one or two gal singers. And, and so they would do Temptations or Aretha Franklin oh, okay. or, wow. or whatever was on the radio. They'd format the scene to, you know. Wow. Yeah, so this was uh, really geared to dancing. D yeah. You know, so it wasn't uh, your Fleur de Lis style. No, no. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> do you remember that place? Yeah. We went to Fleur de Lis. Yeah. When we went to Fleur de Lis, usually we would go with... A handful of guys, and we'd rent one tuxedo, and because we all got you know twenty bucks from right. our parents, and then we get one tuxedo, and one person would go in, and then they would sneak out, and then we change clothes, and then the next guy would go in. So by the time it was wow. that whole you know thing was over with, you know we we'd have a hundred bucks, uh -oh. you know, between us all. So wow, why? So, that was pretty smart, actually. But yeah, uh, CYCs were very much like um, teen town uh, mixers, okay. Okay. where this was, you know, there was that sweet spot of time, you know, we were young enough, mo you know, most of the people who went to the CYCs were, uh, say, 13 to maybe 17. So nobody was there for trouble, mm. you know, mm. th sometimes there'd be people who fought, yeah. you yeah. know, and, and uh, but... For the most part, people weren't drinking, you know, or, and that was before 68, there was no such thing as right. like drugs yeah. Be, yeah. being an issue. Right. Wow. And so it was just a, a lot of people there, you know, uh, experiencing the music, 
dancing if you wanted to, but that was kind of terrifying. So, mm. you know, you, there was usually a, a group of guys standing in the back just kind of, you know, acting tough. And, yeah. But, you know, we're the ones that really liked the, the music. Uh, ah, okay. But this was before the CYC band were the old style of music. Guitar hadn't become a dominant feature. Okay. Even though, you know, the Beatles hit in 64 over here, and you know, guitars became a big thing. The ba the bands were working back then were still very much keyboard and horn dominated. Okay. Rarely would you ever see a band with more than one guitar player, and their job was not to take solos. I see. Yeah. You know, like they if they were playing Soul Man by Sam and Dave, yeah. they'd do the intro riff. But there was no Jimi mm. Hendrix moment. Uh, you know, not not yet. It was not a little yet. early. Yeah. yeah. So, um, when when did you uh, start getting into the Grateful Dead? Um, and what was, uh, do you remember any of the shows that see. you went to? Well, I, got, I guess I got into them right when their first album came out, so that would have been um, mid-67. Oh. And, uh, but I didn't go see them until, they came so many times at first. Hmm. Like, they came in... Um, May of 68, and then they came in uh, February of 69, and then April of 69. Now, were they playing the Fox at that, that no, time? No. The first time they came, they played for uh, two nights in, at the National Guard Armory, and that was uh, May of 1968. And, uh, and this is the same armory they just sort of renovated recently. Yes. Okay. Yeah. In downtown, the, or midtown, I guess. Right. There was a series of concerts there that uh, they had The Dead, Steppenwolf, I think, and then a little bit later, uh, Mother Earth and Dr. John and The Birds. Oh, oh wow. So that was a viable concert place. For, uh, Georgie Martinez did that, and he's the same guy that brought uh, the Jefferson Airplane the oh. first time they oh, came wow. in July okay. of 68. Now, who, who's this uh, Georgie Martinez? Georgie Martinez, he's... Uh, a guy who actually owned a club in Gaslight Square called uh, Georgie's. Uh -oh. uh, maybe it's Jorge's. It's J O R G E mm. apostrophe S. Okay. And both Miles Davis and Wes Montgomery have albums that were kind of semi bootleg, but they're they were recorded there. Uh oh, wow. Uh, Grant Green, other people. Yeah, um, Grant Green's a uh, St. Lucian. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I guess I want to talk about the Fox Theater and the Dead because okay. they're, those shows are sort of known for their uh, some of the best Grateful Dead shows mm -hmm. ever, maybe in this town ever seen. Mm. Or, did you go to any of those? And, yeah, I went to all those. Oh, you did. So the, why, why were they so good? I mean, well, the um, the first time they played there was uh, February of nineteen seventy, and uh that was the f yeah that was pretty much the first rock concert that was held at the fox so we we now we think of the fox as oh this is a place where concerts are held all the time but uh throughout all of the 70s it was rarely used for concerts oh. and then it kind of went downhill and was sold off and uh but um in February of 1970, The Dead played there, and then in June of 70, Traffic played there. Oh. And But The Dead didn't come back there until, I think, March of 1971, and they played maybe two nights, and then I think they played either, I think later in that year, they played three nights. Mm. So I think the reason that those concerts are so well known is when they released Working Man's Dead in, uh, say, May of 1970, mm. that's when they really started becoming popular. And they, they played at Merrimack in May of 1970. Merrimack? Uh, Community College. Oh, okay. And they did a free concert the night before at uh, Wash U, uh. which is not really documented, but we found pictures of it. They just decided to go there and do a show. And, oh. It was actually an, uh, an acoustic Grateful Dead with Weir and Garcia 
and they would do a handful of songs, and then the new writers would play, and then the dead would close the night out. Oh, wow. But that didn't really happen because it was, it was kind of raining, and, and mm. the attendance was real oh. sparse because it was like one of those, it was so secret, oh. nobody showed up. Oh. <laughs> so I think the <laughs> dead did. looked out at the crowd and went, oh, let's just go home. Yeah. <laughs> and so, they, yeah, they played wow. the next night at Merrimack Community College, and, and then the next time they came to the area was at the Mississippi River Festival in July of 1970, and that's when they exploded because um, Working Man's Dead uh, had come out. Oh, and all of a sudden, there was this brand new audience. Oh. And then they came in October of 70 at the Keele Opera House, and that was the first time it was really hard to get tickets. Oh. And then from then on, any time after... Um, when they f started doing their run of shows at the Fox, like in 1971 and 72, those tickets were really hard to get. Oh. Just because they were just so huge after Working Man's Dead and, and American Beauty. Um, what were the prices of those tickets, do you remember? Uh, definitely under $10. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I, uh, I think it was when the Rolling Stones came in um, 1972 for the... Uh, Exile on Main Street tour. I think those tickets were like ten dollars, oh, and wow. it was like, whoa, they're ripping us. Yeah, off. right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, what? Why do you think? Uh, what, what was the significance of the dead in St. Louis? Why do you think they had such a uh, connection here? Hmm. I don't know. It, it started. It was interesting. It started off in. Um, 1968, it seems like there were a lot of kids from Ladue that got them. Mm. And the, the, uh, some of the people I know from Ladue that graduated in 1969 and 1970, they were at the forefront of going to the, these early dead shows. Uh -huh. and it, was a, it was a much different experience back then because uh, it, in the shows in 1968 and 69, they were still very much a jam band. Oh, okay. And, you know, it was the whole thing of get really, really high, uh, go see the dead. Yeah. And, uh, oh, okay. But then after Working Man's Dead came out, and especially after American Beauty, then they changed their sound where they were more song oriented. Mm -hmm. And so instead of playing like, say, eight songs, you know, yeah. which were, you know, mainly just long jam songs. Right. Then they were starting to play 20 and 30 songs. Oh, okay. And the concerts got longer and longer, too. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that, that the, the popularity of country rock was kind of an unknown thing, like, say, prior to mm, Flying Burrito Brothers and Poco and mm -hmm. those bands yeah. in 1969. And then Crosby, Stills, and Nash had their first album in 1969. And I think that, that people were just starting to become more aware of the you know, uh, merging of country and rock, mm. that, that it was a, a new sound. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, maybe just because we're in, in the Midwest, uh, that we're such a uh, country music yeah. area, that the idea of, of seeing... Uh, the Dead do a Merle Haggard song, yeah. which was really a cool thing yeah. because it was uncool to like country music, uh, right? You know, because it was just that was uh, any because the the politics were so divisive mm. back, you know, in yep. the time of the Vietnam War, right. that if you looked like a country person, you, you assumed square. they were yeah. a love it or leave it. Uh -huh type of, uh, I remember that, yeah. you know, person like, you know, yeah. Oki from Muskogee yeah. is, is basically some people view it, you know, as a fun song and other people view it as Merle was really in, in a sense, you know, speaking to his, his, mm. uh, country music fans oh, like see. the hippies are no good. And, uh -huh. and yeah. of course we all knew that, you know, Merle was, <laughs> yeah, he was on the bus yeah. just like Willie was, <laughs> Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> Well, um, so why why do you think uh, the dead, you know, what was it about St. Louis that they sort of connected to? Was it because of the fans? That there were so many fans here? Um, well, I, I think it was a, a place, a stopping off place. When Like whenever they would tour, they'd always go to Chicago. So I think it was just a mm. – uh, they, they, they – 
1969, they were still very much uh, a regional band in, in California. And okay. even though they would, they would come here, the, you know, the, most of their touring dates were on the West Coast, over, well over half of them, and then some on the East Coast, and they'd have to get, you know, uh, yeah. uh, you know from San Francisco to New York, so they'd stop in oh, various okay. places. Um, but by, in 1970, they had a, a concerted effort to play as many colleges as they could. Mm. Uh, it wasn't a money-making thing. It was just a way to get their brand out there. Mm. And so I think that's what happened. And then <clears throat> they loved the Fox a whole lot. And so, you know, then they started, they became so popular that instead of playing at Keel Auditorium for one night, and to have 10,000 people there, they, you know, had enough respect for their fans, and their fans had a, had uh, expectations of mm. great sound because mm. the Dead were really the first band to pioneer the idea of a great PA system. Uh. There was no, prior to Owsley and those guys uh, developing monitors, mm. the idea of having monitors... Uh, just, yeah. Now, didn't Heil have something to do with them or not? Uh, well, or was he later? It, it's reported oh. that Heil, but basically Heil's involvement with them was before they came to St. Louis the first time in, in February of 1970, they got busted right before that in New Orleans. Mm. And they confiscated some of their equipment. But uh, it's been misreported that Heil provided all the PA and the equipment, oh. which is just not true because the only thing he supplied was the mains. Oh, okay. But all, all the Dead's equipment made it oh. for the show. And then it's also been misreported in Billboard that Heil went on tour with them in 1970, which is just not true. So. Huh. That's interesting. Heil, has, Heil yeah. is famous for a whole lot of things, like right. his involvement with The Who and things like that. But he had nothing to do with the development of the dead sound oh, okay. or the wall of sound oh, okay. or any of that. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I remember the dead was known for their wall of sound. You know, yeah. They had just ridiculous amount of speakers. Yeah, that was, but that was only in uh, that 1973-74 era. Oh, okay. Up until then... They had a much more modest oh, okay. setup because oh. they weren't playing. The, 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 the wall of sound was developed so they could actually play big outdoor venues. Ah. And, and so instead of playing, you know, the Fox, which is 4,000 people, let's yeah. say, they were playing, you know, much bigger venues. Mm. And the idea was they, you know, wanted to come up with a sound system where you know, if you were, like, say, at a Mississippi River Festival type thing where yeah. there could be 10,000 people or yeah. so, that the sound was actually good. Yeah, yeah. You know. And this was, uh, I guess, uh, post-Woodstock. and Right. You know, and that sound, I don't know if it was any good up there. But um, Now, <clears throat> Jerry Garcia had was taught pedal steel from... Scotty. Scotty. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I mean, and he was here a lot. Taking lessons from Scotty, right? Um, I'm not sure how much of that is legend or truth, but Garcia, even though he had a steel guitar as early as 1967, he didn't really use it. Mm. But but around mid 1969, he got his first pedal steel uh, that made sense to him. He bought it from a store in Denver, mm. and they shipped it out to him. And Garcia is such a, you know organized studying type of guy he's the first guy up in the morning with his coffee and he would practice pedal steel for uh, however long he needed to each day uh, okay. and so within a couple of months he was already gigging uh, you know uh with a version of the new riders oh, playing wow. pedal steel oh, okay so um the first time that uh garcia went to scotty's music store was probably either merrimack which would have been uh, May of 1970, but they certainly went in uh, October of 1970 because there's uh, pictures oh, okay. that have surfaced. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there's maybe some friends of yours that were actually there maybe? When yeah, well, uh, my friend Randy Shore, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, I, I think he said he, he either rode his bicycle up up to Scotty's music and... And he was just hanging out there, 
and they they told him one day, hey, you know, we got somebody coming in. You, you can you can hang around, but you got to behave. And <laughs> and he they didn't tell him who it was, and uh, then all of a sudden Garcia and the, and oh. Weir, I think, and a couple other guys came in, and and so Garcia bought. I think three or four pedal steels from Scotty. That's pretty much documented. Oh, okay. And then whenever wow. the dead would come to town uh, or near St. Louis, uh, Garcia would make a trip out to Scotty's. And so I don't know how much teaching he needed mm -hmm. because he was such a quick learner. Yeah. You know, to, yeah. if you listen to the uh, the the recordings of new writers that were done like within six months or more after he first started mm. playing, it's pretty extraordinary how, you know, yeah. how much he had picked up. Of course, he was a banjo player, so he already had his right hand yeah. completely together. Yeah, I, I've heard that uh, Scotty would really teach how to damp mm. correctly and because that was really tricky on the pedal steel. Yeah. So I just surmise that maybe that's what some of those lessons you know, from Scotty were like, make sure you, you know, keeping that hand in the right position. But Just some obvious tips. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, technical tips. Right. The music, I'm sure he had in his head, you know. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, because he was such a, a roots guy. You know, they've, uh, they've got that new collection out, like Before the Dead or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like a four-CD collection of all of the acoustic uh, music they have from, you know, parties and, and oh. radio shows and gigs from like roughly 1960 to 64. And, and this is all Garcia playing uh, guitar and, and mainly oh, banjo. Okay. Oh, wow. Singing, you know, Stanley Brothers, right. Bluegrass Carter and, Family, yeah. you know, tons of bluegrass songs. Oh, okay. Now, now I want to ask you about Chuck Berry. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what, what, what was the impact you think Chuck Berry had on just St. Louis? I mean, you know, we know he was from here and, you know, Mm. Lived here pretty much. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, he's he kind of brought the guitar a little higher to the to the front, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Like, say if um, Chuck came out in mid nineteen fifty five with Maybelline, and then uh, Buddy Holly was a couple years later, and so I and so maybe those two guys were the first guys that really started changing things. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, it was more uh, guitar-oriented right. singer-songwriter. That you know that was uh, a new model. Before it was more like you know the Elvis Presley model, where mm. he was the singer but wasn't known for his guitar playing nor his songwriting. Mm. Whereas with uh, both Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly, it was more like the Hank Williams model, ah, where you yeah. have a complete oh. package all in one. Oh, that's well said. Yeah, that's a. That's good. Good look at it like that. And then, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, big difference between, say, somebody like Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly is Chuck's guitar style, which is a lot of times uh, misunderstood, is that he uh, came out of the big band boogie scene and not not necessarily the mm. blues scene. The you know the blues scene, say like he, even though he loved Muddy Waters and and the blues players. They, you know, tuned their either tuned their guitar or they were just playing regular open string chords. So mm -hmm. they were playing, the, you know, the chords way down at the bottom, like E, A, D, yeah. G, things like that. Whereas Chuck didn't do that ever. He he favored playing in in horn keys. I see. So that's yeah. why all his songs are in B flat, E flat, mm. you know, and uh, other keys that. You know, are are more favorable to horns, and and um, Chuck could sing certainly in any key. Yeah, he had, yeah. a, you know, he had a, a wide range, mm. so he could have very easily chosen to play, you know, in the key of E, which would be really really simple. Right. But he but roll over Beethoven is in E yeah. flat. Yeah. But he, you know. I think you told me one time that he never really played those chords down at the. Never played at open the, chords. At the end, I guess, I think, at right. the neck. Yeah. yeah, he's always closed position. Yeah. Which is, uh, that's pretty interesting. I never really thought of it like that, but every time you see him play, he's never never down there. Right. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. he's yeah, he, <laughs> he's pretty. right in the middle of the guitar. Yeah. Which, you know, for some people would say that's the, you know, the, the guitar has this, you know, 
best sound. I mean, it has a more rock sound mm. down when you're playing open mm. strings, like that credence type sound, yeah, yeah. you know. But like if uh, between, if you're fretting, you know, full chords between, you know, G and B flat has, that's a really, really nice sound right there. It's not, mm. it's not too low and it's not too high. It's very, you know, very rich. Yeah. Now, is it true that you saw the Beatles at uh, Bush Stadium? No, it's not no, true. No, it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Uh. <laughs> now, the, the reason why I didn't is because my parents exiled me to summer camp every oh. single year. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1966, I was, they sent me up to uh, the uh, boundary waters between Minnesota and Canada. Oh, wow. And it was a, a seven-week. Moose Lake. Uh, you up there? Oh, anyway. No, it was International Falls. Oh, okay. Yeah. And... Uh, so yeah, I missed the Stones and the Beatles. Ah, uh, okay. It's really a shame. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would have gone with a buddy of mine because he went to both, and we were oh. already hanging out. You know, like he and I were had our own little group together. Mm. You know, it was just uh, uh, two electric guitars into one amp oh, type yeah. of band. <laughs> um, so, have you ever seen the Beatles? No. No. Okay. I mean, I've seen, I've seen Paul. Okay. Yeah. 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 I've seen yeah. Paul and Ringo. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Who who are your, some of your favorite local bands? Local? Uh, or if you have any, I don't know. Or anything that uh, in the last few years, you know. No, I don't mean, you know, like this week or anything. Um, the bands that, that play uh, country around town that, are, that really have, you know, mm. Great guitar players in the band. Yeah, you know almost any of those bands I like. So you know uh, Colonel Ford. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know all. Yeah. So you know wherever you know Gary. Oh yeah, Gary Hunt and, right. and John Horton. Right. And, yeah. and those guys play. You know. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the sound. Stuff, yeah. I really really like that yeah. sound. It, the Buck Owens Merle Haggard. Right. Type. Yeah. Um, Classic. Uh, yeah. Roots country. And then um, recently, I've been following um, a lot of the the gals that sing the old barrel house blues, and and have uh, really good piano players uh, or, yeah. or you know jazz players that are playing old you know music from the twenties and the thirties. So it isn't like they're not playing bebop. Right, they're, right. They're, they're playing in, a, in an old style, mm. and. Uh, you know, there's some within the last couple of years since I've been back in town. Um, you know, there's just been so many bands that mm, you know, yeah. or a handful of bands yeah. that, that really specialize in yeah. that older style. Yeah, I think Ethan Lewan. Right. He's a great piano player. Yeah. Who actually moved from New York, and lives here now and plays. And yeah, I'm hopefully get him on this podcast someday. But yeah, he would have a lot uh, to add because. If it's true that he came here to specifically be in the St. Louis area because of our rich piano tradition, mm -hmm. then you know that's yeah, uh, yeah. That means he's got a lot of knowledge yeah, in that area. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, he's he's worth going to see for sure. So, um, the old time scene in St. Louis is is you know totally new to me. Mm. But uh, you know the number of shows that that the Focal Point has uh, that, that feature. Old time musicians yeah, is, yeah. is really nice. Oh, it is, yeah. Yeah, we're kind of uh, spoiled, I think, around here. There's a lot of styles of music we can go see live. Right. You yeah. Know? So, which is good. It's a good thing. And there's a lot of uh, really good jazz, too. Yeah. Doesn't get, seem to get out to the county as much as, mm, you know, nah, it's, it's, it's nah, probably not. Pretty much in the, the art center. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Let's see. Uh, do you know anything about the Aerobonds? Is that? Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. But no, I don't know anything about them other than just kind of like the, the what you hear the the stories. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you didn't have it. You didn't know any of them. I didn't know any of them. Um, well, I've since met Ferd. Oh, Ferd. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but I didn't know Ferd. Uh, I knew of of him. Oh. Okay. Because I think one time uh, there was a concert. Maybe Southside Johnny and John Cougar <laughs> Mellencamp, and and the and it was uh, the word was hey there's a guy in St. Louis who's in 
John Mellencamp's uh, band. It was first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, I don't know any of those guys. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you you lived in Texas for a while. Yep. Now, were you in the music scene down there at all? Or? Um, only in the in the capacity of going to uh, blues jams. So I moved down there in 1987, and the blues scene was really happening there. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Myers from Anson, oh, yeah, okay. Anson's band, um, he was living in town there, and he, he was constantly... Uh, you know, playing around the jams. Uh, Mike Judge, the guy who developed Beavis and Butthead, he, he was one. He was in town and was one of the main uh, bass players oh, in town. Really? Uh, Johnny Moeller was there, and he, he's was in um, the Fabulous T Birds for a while. So there was a Paul mm. Size was mm. there, and and he went uh, on to be in the the Red Devils, mm. I think. Mm. Um, my buddy Hash Brown, Mike Morgan. So there was a really, really healthy jam mm. scene. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this was in what part of Texas? Uh, n just all over Dallas. Oh, Dallas. Yeah. Okay. Oh. We talked a little bit about your... Well, no, we didn't, but we should talk about your blog because we're only scratching the surface of your knowledge. Oh, yeah. So, and I think the blog has a lot of information. Yeah. That people are interested in, I guess, Grateful Dead music... I don't know what else is on there, but... Uh, that's all that's on there. Oh, okay. The, so that blog started... Um, I had a lot of time on my hands, and, and uh, I, I have an interest in photography, or just in, in images. And so uh, I decided, well, I, I want to you know, collect all the photos that I can from those shows. Oh. And that led me to uh, a buddy of mine, Craig Petty, who took pictures, uh, dozens of pictures, mm. uh, at the May 1968 show and also the uh, April 1969 show at the Quadrangle. Oh, wow. And, then, and also the first Fox show. And then another buddy of mine, Steve Dibel, he took pictures of the 71 and 72 shows. Mm. And so... Uh, so how do we get to the blog? The blog. Hmm. Do we have to, like... Put your name in Google and... I think the best way, to, there's, a, there's a site called Dead Essays. And then I would just include in the search St. Louis shows 1968 to 71. Okay. Because that's what we decided to do is I was working with a guy who already had an established blog. And I was talking to him and said, hey, I have an interest in doc helping you document the shows in St. Louis. And... This took place over about a period of a year, and the uh, the more we dug into it, the more uh, I, I was the on the front front end of the research. And f every single time I found uh, a picture, then there was you know an associated story that went oh, along with it. And okay. eventually, I think we found fifty or almost a hundred pictures from the shows, the earliest shows from '68 to '71. We had a cutoff. Or it was, oh, wow. We only did the pig pen oh, era. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's a. Uh, it, uh, I interviewed dozens and dozens of people that went to the early shows and. and oh uh, wow. Okay. So, so how, how say that uh, uh, link or how do you get to the blog again? Uh, Dead essays, St. Louis, nineteen sixty eight. Oh. Okay. That should bring you there. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, Great. And uh, so what What about, what are you doing musically these days? Well, let's see. What night is it? It's Friday. <laughs> we have a night off. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I play with um, Ellen Gomez in a... Fiddle player. Fiddle player. And uh, we play every night. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so uh, that that's... Uh, an acoustic duo. Oh, okay. In in that environment, I had to learn how to play. You know, throw all throw away all my BB King skills oh. <laughs> and focus entirely mm. on supplying backup rhythm guitar. Yeah, which is it, it's a totally different mindset. And, totally different. Yeah. 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 Um, and so we do that, and then um, other times during the week when. Uh, a third or yeah. a fourth <laughs> it, member is available, then, then we get together yeah. uh, in, a, in a broader acoustic setting. 
And then, as you know, on uh, once a week, yes. we get together and uh, have our electric band. Right. And which is fun. It's which a is fun. a lot of fun. Uh, well, good. Um, if someone wants to see your uh, acoustic duo, is there any place we can come watch? I think we have a gig coming at Piers Store. And where's that? Is it in town or is that out of town? Marthasville. Oh, Marthasville, yeah. That's about 30, 40 minutes, I guess. Yeah. So that's... June 29th, Saturday, June 29th, noon. Oh, okay, great. So that, that's a cool little place, uh, Marthasville. So yeah. Have you played there before? Uh, one time. Oh, okay. So yeah. the, that's an opportunity to really uh, hear Ellen play because yeah, she does yeah. that style of music where it's, it's not bluegrass that uh, is so much about playing super fast and then I- improvising. Right, right. It's more set tunes yes, that are yeah. really so much fun to play. Oh, great, yeah. And then we both sing. Uh, so Oh, great, you know, yeah. We do songs from the 60s sometimes, but yeah. then we do a whole lot of songs from the 20s and 30s. Great. Yeah. So that's June, 29th. sorry, June 29th, noon to 3, Marthasville, mm-hmm. Missouri. So The Pierce Store. Oh, it's on the Katy Trail. That's right. Thank you. Anyway, so... Well, great. I'll wrap it up here because you should come back. All right. Because I know I know you have a lot of info in that brain here. So, <laughs> but I really appreciate you coming over and uh, you know giving us a good, really good St. Louis history. It's to me, it's important to know how this all kind of, you know, there's a lot of bands in town. There's reasons for it, I think, and those are some of the reasons, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's it's really interesting how the. During the the CY scene, the, that era, which really ended right around 1968, just how many bands were able to play mm, back then? Yeah, that's you know, cool. Dozens huh? of bands playing for Teen Town. Now we don't have Teen Town so right, much, right. which is yeah. I just don't understand that. Well, you know, I don't know. There's probably a few reasons. The internet might be one. Yeah, <laughs> who knows? But anyway. Yeah, they're on their phone. Yeah. yeah. Well, John, thank you for right. uh, coming over here, and appreciate your time. And uh, hope to see uh, you and Ellen playing on June 29th in Marthasville, noon to three. And um, we will see you at the next gig. All right, appreciate it. Remember to like and subscribe to this podcast, and we'll see you backstage. Backstage.